Maybe we can pause him for a minute. <laughs> How do we feel? We're good? Okay. Let's try again. Zach, I'm going to wait for you. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Killer Writers House. Uh, I'm Davey Niddle. You're at City Planning Poetics 8, Urban Ruins. How many of you have been to City Planning Poetics before? Uh, a couple of returners. Um, how many of you, this is your first visit to the Kelly Writers House? Oh, awesome. Delightful. Uh, before I introduce you to uh, tonight's uh, lovely uh, readers and speakers, Dan Biddle in the screen and Donna Stonecipher in real live human form, uh, the irony of this is that Dan lives in Philadelphia normally and Donna lives in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to Zach Gardner, who has done many, many hours of work to make Dan appear in non-human form. Uh, we weren't sure that was going to happen, and I'm very relieved that these two folks get to be in dialogue, uh, if by these means. Uh, and to th I wanted to say thanks to Heidi and to Jessica Lowenthal. Uh, lots of folks do tons of work so that we can be in this space. There are um, an enormous number of folks uh, preparing a reception and selling books right now, and I wanted to say thanks because lots of labor goes into our being able to be here. Speaking of which, there is a wonderful reception after this program in the dining room. Please stick around, have a snack, tell Donna what a great reader she is, wave to Dan on the screen, etc. Okay. Yesterday, the Israeli Antiquities Authority announced the uncovering of a 5,000-year-old megalopolis in northern Israel what the Jerusalem Post referred to as, quote, one of the most significant archeological findings in recent history. The ruins showed a web of roads and alleys demonstrating the planning of the city, its houses and its routes of navigation. These findings are ruins in the sense of the Oxford English Dictionary's first definition, quote, the state or condition of collapse or downfall. Collapse in this case, was produced at least in part by time. But collapse also suggests either force or neglect, as a building might collapse in a flood or an earthquake, but also if left to decay. Three weeks ago, one of the feature stories in the New York Times Magazine chronicled what its headline referred to as, quote, the disappearing schools of Puerto Rico. Its description read, over the past three years, Hundreds of schools have closed across Puerto Rico. Their ruins are among the most visible evidence of the island's vicious circle of poor governance, neglect by Washington and environmental catastrophe. In this case, the ruins of the schools also refer to the collapse of their buildings and more clearly implicate collapse as a power relation, either a relation of active destruction by humans or one of neglect or sometimes of both destruction and neglect working together. Then again, sometimes the differentiation between destruction and neglect isn't a meaningful one. Donna Stonecipher's manuscript in progress, The Ruins of Nostalgia, opens, quote, it was the last unrenovated building in the city, and all who came to inspect its weathering tears fell inwardly to their knees in veneration. Later in the poem, Stonecipher writes of the poem's subject, she wanted to understand the ruinousness of renovation. The poems make clear that collapse or downfall is a key aspect of procedures of predatory urban change. The poems implicate themselves in shaping narratives of urban change as they draw attention to the placemaking potential of language. Later in the first poem, Stonecipher writes, she wanted people to be decently housed but she also wanted to cause irreparable damage to narratives of progress washing over the city with their pale blue saline reminiscence of forgetfulness. The poem's speaker takes two issues with predatory urban change, that it imperils many residents' access to equitable housing, and that it also facilitates a progress narrative in which stratifying development signals that cities are improving. This narrative encourages city residents who are not directly threatened by development to forget the city's past as a way of justifying its present as logical and desirable, rather than as objectionable and violent. Later in the project, the poem, The Ruins of Nostalgia 20, opens. Where there once had been a low-end stationery store minded by an elderly beauty queen, there was now a store for high-end espresso machines minded by nobody. 
The poems catalog urban places lost to predatory urban change. But perhaps more importantly, they implicate themselves as actors enabled to refuse it, as representations of the city and its history, present, and future. Poems can hold urban places accountable for change that values the capital accumulation of the few over all city residents' right to equitable urban life. Ruins, the poems argue, ask us to put pressure on what remains a part of the urban built environment over time and what is consigned to the past. Collapse, the poems tell us, is never accidental, but always an assemblage of design, maintenance, and weather. Nostalgia imagines the past as perhaps outside of power or perhaps refusing it, while a critical engagement with ruins refuses a non-situated relationship to any place and troubles any idea of place that isn't pressurized by who gets to be there, what they get to do in that place, and how long they get to stay. Stonecipher's poems reveal that extant ruins of the built environment evidence the violence caused by the neoliberal transformation of cities, as they also suggest that urban space has never been outside of ideology, that buildings and city plans have always been designed and constructed with the benefit of some residents and uses and the neglect of others in mind. Daniel R. Biddle's work and his four decades as a journalist and editor bear out that how we represent cities is integral to the determination of the populations to whom they can belong. An article he co-authored on Philadelphia's fiscal crisis in 1990 includes the sentences, if the city of Philadelphia can't piece together a $150 million emergency loan soon, it is ready to send out a letter warning city workers they won't get their full paychecks next week and asking them to stay on the job anyway. But the long-term restructuring of the illogical haphazard way that Philadelphia raises money and spends money will take more thought, more time, and undoubtedly more blood and tears. Reporting on corruption and neglect in the Philadelphia of the 1980s and 1990s, Biddle asked repeatedly how a late 20th century Philadelphia became the ruins of its mid-century self and at whose expense, and he repeatedly holds the city accountable for foreclosing the right to equitable lives for many of its residents, and disproportionately for its residents of color and residents in poverty. Biddle's reporting has consistently worked to link the quality of daily life for Philadelphians to the management of its budget, justice system, and streets. Reporting on a move in 1988 in the city's sanitation system to use larger garbage trucks and thereby employ fewer workers, an article Biddle co-authored reads, this kind of far-sighted management change, accomplished in partnership with the union, has been the exception in a city often handcuffed by ironclad and outdated work practices and a dearth of management employees. And this kind of cooperation must be forged again and again if Philadelphia is to overcome a projected $230 million deficit out of a $2 million budget and then make the changes necessary to attack the deeper structural, political, and economic problems that got the city into this mess. Reading Stonecipher and Biddle's work together raises the question not only of how to read ruins, but to interrogate the systems of our own daily lives that are complicit in the collapse of the buildings and procedures upon which others depend. Donna Stonecipher is the author of five books of poetry, most recently Transaction Histories 2018, which was cited by the New York Times as one of the 10 best poetry books of 2018. She has published one book of criticism, Prose Poetry in the City. Her poems have been published in many journals, including the Paris Review, have been translated into eight languages. In 2018, she won a working grant from the Berlin Zenat. She translates from German and her translation of Austrian poet Frederica Mayrocker's Etudes, for which she received an NEA fellowship, is forthcoming in 2019. She lives in Berlin. Daniel R. Biddle, the Philadelphia Inquirer's former politics editor, has worked as a journalist for four decades. His Inquirer's stories in the courts won a Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. As an editor, he helped direct Inquirer investigative projects, regional news coverage, and reporting on elections. He and Mar Marie Dubin co-authored Tasting Freedom, Octavius Cato and the Battle for Equality in Civil War America, Temple University Press 2010. Bill previously worked as a reporter for the Plain Dealer of Cleveland, Ohio. He has a BA in history from the University of Michigan and has been a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University. He teaches journalism at the University of Delaware and at Penn and lives in West Philadelphia. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dan and Donna to the Kelly Writers House. Thanks so much for that, David. It was a brilliant reading of the project. Much You understand it much better than I do. 
<laughs> and are able to articulate it. Um, my, the poems know what they're doing. I can't necessarily articulate it, but you just did, which is amazing. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, I'm going to read some poems about uh, literal ruins, mostly figurative ruins. Um, and we can talk later about what what's the difference. And um, and there's a lot. Of, so there's some ruins, and there's a lot of nostalgia. And we can talk about that too, and what they have to do with each other. Um, so I'm just going to start. I should say that, as Davy mentioned, I live in Berlin and I grew up in Seattle. And in the spring of 2018, it was reported that Berlin has the fastest rising real estate prices of any metropole in the world. And around the same time, it was reported that Seattle has the fastest rising real estate prices in the country. So these are my two cities. This is what's going on. And so that's part of what my poems are reacting to. The Ruins of Nostalgia 8. We drove downtown and got disoriented. There was a forest of towering new towers refracting the familiar landscape, erasing the turns and curves we'd long followed unconsciously in our car to get downtown, where now there was a forest of towers where once had been only forest. We parked and got disoriented. The low, ornamented, turn-of-the-century buildings were being wrecking balled to make way for towering new glass towers wedged between one-way streets, like the one we'd driven up the wrong way as a timid teenager in a blue hornet picking up our sister from her summer job, selling ice cream in the old outdoor market, saved from the wrecking ball by Citizens Initiative. 1971. We tried to find the ice cream shop, but got disoriented. We drove to a neighboring neighborhood and got disoriented. There was the blue bascule bridge, but what was it bridging? Two halves that did not make a whole. We crossed back to the canal where the poplars of our childhood had all been felled, felled, the canal now canal front, canal front property for new residents, paying to muse upon the mutability of moving water. We drove to the wooden house we'd been born in on the ridge, with little windows not showcasing the picturesque mountain view. Little windows because nobody cared back then about views had once elucidated our father, inching ever closer to his own wrecking ball, and got disoriented. For now, each house on the ridge had had its back or front wrecking balled to make way for picture windows, giving the new residents a permanent picture of the picturesque mountains and, were they visible, of the mounting ruins of our nostalgia. So each poem, as I'll quickly be able to tell, but I'll just say it, each poem is titled The Ruins of Nostalgia, and then they're numbered. And uh, each poem except one ends in the phrase The Ruins of Nostalgia. So, The Ruins of Nostalgia 10. They left one monumental worker statue on a wide sidewalk where there was room, but melted down most of the others. The worker in boots and overalls hailed a city that slowly forgot him, that wanted him to be forgotten. As new glass buildings rose all around, the linden trees blossomed and obscured his hailing hand, and traffic whisked people every which way away from him. Traffic has no teleo teleological conclusion. The overgrown cemetery kitty corner had stopped accepting new tenants, and a neglected trove of broken gravestones in the far, far corner all read, Wir vergessen dich nie, which means we'll never forget you, except for one broken into two, Wir vergessen dich nie. And yet somebody did forget. Those who would never forget ever forgot or were ever forgotten in their turn. A promise is a trove of little unbroken permissions to forget, and don't all promisers know it. The worker was left for the tourists, but as the years stopped tending the distance between the worker and the emotional work he was meant to do, fewer and fewer tourists knew what work to do with him, what he signified, 
why he was so outsized and ostentatiously dignified. And so we weren't surprised one day when we walked by and found him missing. Was he melted down, like so many other enigmas of the ruins of nostalgia? The Ruins of Nostalgia 14. She liked to walk past a building she used to live in when she was young, when there were 100,000 empty apartments in the city, it was said, before foreign money jetted in and bought up most of them. She had seen it in an airport once, somewhere, a sign over a desk, foreign money. Actually, it was in Denver. Can lurking around scenes of youthful happiness warm one with a reconstructed glow, like the eight-hour YouTube video of a fire in a fireplace she and her boyfriend fired up each weekend that winter that crackled, spat, and snapped in a reassuringly long loop. But never quite long enough, for around hour five, one of them would get nervous and go click the video back to the beginning. Many types of simulacra can warm one, it is said. A fire is kept in the fireplace. A market is kept in its marketplace. She walked past the cream-colored building with one balcony atop an oriole and thought of her young self living a life that was hers and somebody else's, like watching herself in a YouTube video, watching a YouTube video of a fire in a fireplace, or looking at herself on a stereoscope card, herself and herself at a slightly shifted angle, living her life like dying a slow death, firing up a fire, monetizing money, homing in on a home, Long gone, monetized, O exchequer, foreign money. There was a cemetery with the long alleys of plane trees she'd used as an office, the memorial screwed to the wall across the street, the unrenovated courtyards people were always vanishing into, perhaps leading to some of the 100,000 empty apartments, it was said, all renovated now, all occupied, all vanished. The A bar at one end of the street and the Z-bar at the other. But the A-bar was no longer called the A-bar, and the Z-bar wasn't exactly at its zenith. It wasn't a Z-bar, it was the Z-bar. It was the alleys, the memorial. It wasn't an A-bar. Was nostalgia the, and not nostalgia a? Uh? Was being young knowing there were 100,000 empty apartments in your city, it was said? To whom was foreign money foreign? To whom was foreign money domestic? The marketplace wants to be warmed by the fireplace. The, bu the building she used to live in was a commonplace. Her pockets were a commonplace. She walked up and down the street with her pockets full of foreign money, rubbing herself all over the ruins of her nostalgia. The Ruins of Nostalgia 20. Where there once had been a low-end stationery store minded by an elderly beauty queen, there was now a store for high-end espresso machines minded by nobody. Where once there had been an illegal beer garden in a weedy lot, there was now a complex of luxury lofts with Parisian-style ivory facades. Where once there had been a bookstore and a bike shop and a bakery, there was now a wax museum for tourists. Where once there had been an empty lot, there was now a building. Where once there had been an empty lot, there was now a building. Where once there had been an empty lot, there was now a building. Where once there had been an empty lot, there was now a building. Where once there had been farms, there were now subdivisions. Where once there had been subdivisions, there were now sub subdivisions. We lived in one of the sub subdivisions of a subdivision. We ourselves had become subdivided, where once we had merely been of two minds. Where once there had been a river, there was now a road. A vocal local group had started a movement to break up the road and daylight the river, which still flowed in the dark underneath the road. Could we daylight the farms, the empty lots, the stationery store, the elderly beauty queen, the city we moved to? Was it still flowing somewhere under the luxury lofts, deliquescing in the dark, inhabited by our luxury selves, not yet subdivided? because not yet whole. Could we daylight the ruins of nostalgia? The ruins of nostalgia 23. 
some inhabitants of a city were milling around a room one sunny day, looking at an exhibit of historical maps of earlier iterations of their city, all carrying fragile nostalgias in their minds, which they all thought of as the only possible nostalgia. But in fact, they were inhabiting a city radiating with multiple and multi-lexical and multi-stratigraphic nostalgias. The structure was concentric. Newer inhabitants, whose nostalgia was on the inner rings, tended to talk about it more. One brand new inhabitant at a dinner party, possibly on coke, was so nostalgic that he wasn't even nostalgic for the past, but for the present, a kind of pre-order nostalgia, because he knew it couldn't last, it couldn't last, he kept repeating, shaking his head, his wide eyes staring glazed at the table. Couldn't last? It's already over, thought the rest of the guests who were longer-term inhabitants. But they sipped their wine in silence, for their nostalgias were on wider rings. Their nostalgias were, of, co of course, also the only possible nostalgias. The city's maps were usually kept in the dark, in an archive, <coughs> in flat files, their ornamental lettering and pale pink and yellow shaded quadrants and their schematized trees and their utopian onanisms and their erasures and their projections. Silenced in flat files, like the most tenderly ideological utterances. Each map made of star matter was the only possible map. The city streets pulsed with this secret retrogressive melancholy preoccupation with the rings of its inhabitants' multiple nostalgias widening and widening. But what was at the center of the concentric rings? Was it the same thing that was at the center of trees' rings? or at the center of rings widening out from an unknown catalyst on a lake? Was the center of nostalgia an absence, or was the nostalgia for absence a center around which to build a liquid orientation, a concentrically spreading stain of emotional acquiescence? The sunlight came into the room with a peacefulness one remembers from rooms in one's early childhood, a sunlight encountered later only in one's dreams. That's a quote from James Baldwin. But wasn't it rather a kind of cold starlight bathing the ruins of the only possible nostalgia? And this poem is um, about a literal ruin um, in the middle of Berlin. There's a church that was bombed um, at the end, near the end of World War II called the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church. And it was left in its ruined state or the steeple was left in its ruined state and it's sort of, um, yeah, still there, <laughs> 70, 70 whatever years later. And um, so that's, some of you might know that, um, might know that steeple, that's what this is about. The Ruins of Nostalgia 58. It got harder and harder over the years to keep the ruin kept as a reminder of the horrors of war in its designated state of ruin. With time, the ruin did what ruins do, kept further ruining. It is in this way that symbols resist what they symbolize. A jagged verdigree steeple bitten off by a bomb, ruining down to the threshold beyond which the symbol turns into the opposite of a symbol, the thing itself. The bomb was the thing itself, presumably. The war was the thing itself, even though it was fought in theaters. But the bitten off steeple was no longer the thing itself, and the church it somberly crowned was a symbolic church to which flocked not the faithful, but the ambivalent. But is the opposite of a symbol the thing itself? Or does the thing itself inhabit the interior of the symbol like a ruin, a ruin kept ruined unto perpetuity, like a piece of amber in which is embedded not the expected insect, but the ruin of an insect? unexpectedly not immortal. As the decades passed, the jagged verdigree steeple bitten off by a bomb was regularly repaired, but not rebuilt, reinforced, but not reimagined, held, but not healed. The healing is regularly postponed in the ruins of nostalgia. And I just have two more. The Ruins of Nostalgia 56. Um, this is explicitly about Seattle. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, that's awesome. We watched a video on the internet of the arena we'd seen our first concert in being bulldozed. We had seen no video of the club where we'd first smoked clove cigarettes and kissed a boy wearing makeup bulldozed. One day it was just no longer there. We had seen no video or photos of our high school being bulldozed. When we heard that our elementary school was scheduled for the wrecking ball, we walked down and took photos of the mural of a deer in a snowy landscape. We'd won a contest to get to paint on the school wall. Shortly after, the deer was bulldozed. We had seen no photos of the cafe where we had first drunk a mocha bulldozed. One day, it was just no longer there. We had been astonished to find a real cafe with real intellectuals in it playing chess. Real Persian cats draped on sills, real mochas and cappuccinos and disheveled newspapers on poles and foxed wallpaper in our own provincial city. By the time the cafe was bulldozed ten years later, we weren't astonished. We had not seen any photos or videos of it bulldozed. One day it was just no longer there. In that bulldozed cafe and other bulldozed cafes around the city, we'd always ordered mochas which bridged our childish love of sweets with our lust for adult narcotics. We had not seen many photos or videos of the sites across which our youth had played out bulldozed, but one by one they must all have been, for one day they were just no longer there. Sometimes we felt sheepish for listing the sites of our youth that had been bulldozed to make room for the bulging of prosperity, though the question of who was really prospering did not stand long before it was bulldozed. Any attempt to any attempt to turn around and glance one last time at the past resulted in that past being instantly bulldozed, bulldozed, bulldozed. For the bulls never doze in the ruins of nostalgia. And uh, this last one is um, kind of ripped from the headlines of last summer. I'm not sure what the status is on this house. Um, there's a story in the Seattle Times that that uh, upset me and inspired me. <laughs> and so this is the poem. The Ruins of Nostalgia, uh, it's number 50 now. The oldest house in the neighborhood is for sale. The oldest house in the neighborhood, owned by the State Garden Club, has been put up for sale. Queen Anne style with leaded glass windows and a turret. The house has been put up for sale by the State Garden Club, to whom it was bequeathed in 1977 by the Ladies' Improvement Club. The bequeathal included a clause that included the clause that the Queen Anne style house and its pear orchards be preserved by the State Garden Club forever. Nevertheless, the State Garden Club has put up the oldest house in the neighborhood for sale. The house is, was, is no longer listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Garden Club went to court to ask for a lifting of the listing on the National Register of Historic Places because the upkeep of the oldest house in the neighborhood with its leaded glass windows and its pear orchards and its historicness is onerous. For 40 years, the Garden Club tended its pear orchards and its garden and intended to preserve its pears and its leaded glass windows and its turret forever. Forever? Forever. Forever? Forever. Pears are preserved into preserves. A historic place is preserved into a historic place, cap H, cap P. A tower slurs into a turret. The oldest house in the neighborhood, with its leaded glass windows and its garden, sits on a lot that could contain an apartment building with 30 to 40 units in a city with an acute affordable housing shortage. But the house was bequeathed forever. But the house, the house, with its leaded glass windows and its garden, its 135 years of existence, its 135 years of pears, its preservation, but the 30 to 40 units, the court allowed the listing to be lifted because the Ladies' Improvement Club was dissolved in 1983 and no ladies were left to protest it. But a lady from the State Garden Club board did resign in protest, an 88-year-old lady named Lona. But Lona, but the 30 to 40 units, but the pear orchards, but the new families, 
but the leaded glass, but the ladies improving and improving, but the Queen Anne style house, but the obsolescence of queens, but the history, the historic place, but the city's acute housing shortage, the homeless people lining the freeways, but the stories the house could tell if it could tell, but Lona, but the neighborhood groups now scrambling to buy the house. What are they trying to preserve? The house, the past, the old neighborhood, the historic place, history, and Lona, but Lona, but the house, the large, old, antiquated, elegant, beloved, hated, fragile as an eggshell house, which escaped fire, earthquakes, the meticulous destructions of time, of everything except prosperity. Built 135 years ago for shelter, will the shelter now be sheltered? But the 30 to 40 units, but Lona, but Lona, but the pear orchard, the garden, the turret, the leaded glass, the house, the house. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I just start? <laughs> that is really a tough act to follow. Those are beautiful poems. Uh, I love Donna's lines about the bulldozing of history. And that kind of gives me a place to transition from. Uh, when Davy uh, invited me to take part in this, and let me add quickly, thanks a million and thank you all for putting up with me at a distance like this. I would much, much rather have been there tonight with you. But uh, in addition to being a mostly newspaper journalist for, for many, many years, lucky me, I got to write this book with my old colleague Murray Dubin um, about Octavius Caddo and the history of black political and intellectual and, and personal struggle in the mid in late 19th century Philadelphia. And um, I want to read to you a, a quote that we unearthed in our many years of research. We thought that book would take us a year. I don't know how Donna wrote eight books. This, this one little book that Marie and I wrote, seven years. But uh, this is about a black intellectual who came out of Connecticut in the 1840s named Amos Beeman, a Congregationalist pastor and a rabble-rousing political leader who was pushing uh, for the right to vote decades before suffrage was finally granted to men of color and later to women. Um, in 1843, Beeman, then a young man, had the presence of mind to send a letter to the world's best known lexicographer of those days, asking a research question, just like I'd love to think one of my students would do now. Uh, the question he asked was whether the lexicographer, author of dictionaries, could help Beeman help point to him any books about the history of African people, of which, of course, Beeman was one. And here's the answer that came back. And this is a quote from the letter. Of the woolly-haired Africans, there is no history, and there can be none. Noah Webster replied, that race has remained in barbarism from the first ages of the world. Now, lucky for Murray and me and lucky for all of us, Beeman knew what he was doing and saved that letter uh, and did not let that be bulldozed. But I think uh, what Davy's invitation really got me thinking about was how um, people in my line of work, mainstream journalists, 
the lamestream media, as Sarah Palin used to say. We bear some responsibility in this. Though I think we're doing a better and better job at seeing the people who lived in those ruins, who had homes and lives and families and hopes and dreams before their homes were bulldozed. We're getting better at that. But we had a long way to go and we still have a long way to go. Something Murray and I discovered from looking at mid 19th century America, particularly Philadelphia, where sort of the hero of our book, Octavius Caddo did most of his growing up after his family came north from Charleston, the capital of slavery. The mass media, the mainstream media in Philadelphia coming up to the Civil War time, you know, when we were starting to get good at that, when there was a vibrant press from all directions, um, mostly partisan, but a lot of it's pretty reliable in many ways. Report the news, get the facts. And of course, newspapers back then were the main source of information for most citizens outside of announcements made by the government or, say, in church. Newspapers were it. So imagine us as modern journalists discovering in our research that the way most newspapers in Philadelphia, and of course this is true all over the United States, but we were looking at, at our city, the way the newspapers back then spoke of black Philadelphia, the infected district, the infected district. The fact that that district contained, as we learned from our research, 19 busy, crowded churches with strong congregations, 30 to 40 fraternal organizations and literary societies that were the mid 19th century equivalent of political clubs today a vibrant push to do the thing for black children that the white establishment had denied them, get them an education. Black men and women like, like Cato's father were busily starting schools. That's not how the white press of those days spoke of black Philadelphia. They wrote of the infected district. We, speaking of reporters back then and editors back then, and the, the intelligentsia of our city, birthplace of, of freedom and all that, the lens through which the white intelligentsia, including the press, viewed this vibrant growing hub of black America, and Philadelphia was the hub, of free black America at Civil War time, much bigger black population than, say, New York City. They viewed it as the infected district because there was a lot of poverty and there was a lot of disease and there was crime. But actually, the great historian out at, at uh, Haverford, great Roger King, studied all the records and found that for all that stereotyping, the actual records of crime in late 19th century Philadelphia revealed that black Philadelphians were on the whole a lot more law abiding than their white counterparts. Well, I want to take you uh, briefly to one example from our book. And again, to use Donna's great line about history getting bulldozed, shards of this black history, of this African American history, did not get bulldozed only because of a few tough stalwarts like Amos Beeman, who kept good records, like the late great William Still. Quick show of hands, class. Anybody hear William Still? I hope a lot of hands went up. There you go. William Still, quick show of hands. Anybody ever hear him? 
S-T-I-L-L, like still waters. Oh, you got it. You know, it's just going to be on the exam. William Still was probably the greatest and most effective leader of the Underground Railroad here in Philadelphia for years. And uh, if you were to carefully add up the data on, on black families living not only in Philadelphia, but further north in New York State and Canada, on their roots, the number of families who owed their initial escape to freedom to William Still probably numbers in the thousands. Well, William Still was also, he had a big ego. And after the Civil War was won, and it was okay to say in polite company that you were part of the Underground Railroad. It was, of course, before the Civil War to announce that meant the risk of persecution or arrest or worse. Once it became popular, William Still wrote a great self-serving history of the Underground Railroad. And for all the self-servingness of it, God bless him because he incorporated lots and lots of real history that for decades was not taught, was essentially erased from modern American history books, but that history survived thanks to William Still. So I'm gonna give you, and he used tons and tons of individual accounts of people who, who'd made their escapes or failed to and who helped and who didn't. And um, here's one of my favorite stories and it, it's in our book which you can buy in paperback edition now for about uh, you know 19 20 bucks uh, better yet go see the statue of octavius cattle that's gone up outside of city hall first statue of a african-american on public city property in our entire city history even though we had a vibrant black community for for centuries first statue talk about bulldozing history well it's the story of a woman named cordelia loney a woman of color in her late 50s in the spring of 1859 when the underground railroad was really at its best kind of on the eve of the civil war um cordelia's owner a virginia widow a mrs cahill who back in Virginia owned about 500 men and women and children, 500, took her annual trip to Philadelphia, along with her house servant, Cordelia Loney. Now, we all know from the history that we did get taught that Philadelphia was a, you know, the birthplace place of freedom, lots of Quakers, good abolitionists, all that stuff. Nonetheless, the intellectual and commercial elites in Philadelphia on the eve of the Civil War were tied lock, stock, and barrel into the slavery system. When Mrs. Cahill came north to stay at a fancy hotel at Ace and Chestnut to hang out with her high society friends, in Philadelphia, and she hung out with the elite of the elite. She probably even hung out with Biddles. Um, staying in that hotel at Eighth and, and Chestnut um, in April of 1859, Loney knew enough, even though she'd been deprived, of course, from any sort of book education, being an enslaved person, she knew enough to know that the Underground Railroad was going strong and that if she passed word to any one of the black waiters or maids or porters in the hotel that she wanted to get free, they would take the message back to William Still and the Underground Railroad. And that's what happened. And the Underground Railroad was so good back then that every time they knew someone was ready to make a break for it and escape, they'd go and try to interview that person first because they knew that the road north was, was full of peril. And if you chose to run from your master in Philadelphia and get on the Underground Railroad, you were in a high risk of being caught, tortured, sent back into slavery, murdered, imprisoned. So an agent from the Underground Railroad sneaks into that hotel one night. You gotta picture this, it's April 1859. The city's all abuzz with the slavery issue by that time. There's even a fugitive slave trial going on in town at Fifth 
on Fifth and Chestnut, just a few blocks away, very publicized. But Cordelia's story is a secret one. The agent of the Underground Railroad sneaks in one night and interviews her about her situation. And Cordelia explains that, that she works for this very wealthy widow who ostensibly treats her quite well, keeps her in good clothing, has Cordelia do, do her hair, which she doesn't know how to do on her own. And, and after the loss of, of her husband, the, the widow's husband, that is, the widow becomes ever more dependent on her, credits Cordelia Loney with taking care of the woman's late husband while he was on his deathbed in Virginia, has Cordelia kneel with her to say prayers every night, feeds her well. Hearing all of this, the Underground Railroad agent stops her and says in so many words, you know, this is a high risk and you, all sorts of things could befall you if you try to make an escape. And we'll, we're good at this, we'll do everything we can, but it seems to me, the agent says, that you're working for a pious owner who treats you well. Which goes to another myth that us mainstream journalists um, took way too long to upend, the myth of the benevolent slaveholder. Very popular thing. Strangely popular, even in history books right up until the last few decades, the benevolent slaveholder kept Cordelia in clothing, prayed with her, took her along to this great city of Philadelphia when Mrs. Cahill came north for her summer vacation with Philadelphia's elite. So the agent says, are you sure you want to take the chance and leave this pious owner? And Cordelia Loney says, let me remind you, this pious owner sold away my two sons and my two daughters. So they make a plan. And a few nights later, while Mrs. Cahill is off hanging out with high society Philadelphia, breaking bread and drinking wine and the Underground Railroad slips Cordelia Loney out of that hotel right at 8th and Chestnut and starts hiding her in black Philadelphia to await her first chance to board the Underground Railroad and make her way to safety in Canada. Well, her escape sets off the 1859 equivalent of headline news in high Philadelphia society. Mrs. Cahill knows everybody. She knows the publishers, the editors, the lawyers, big time merchants and politicians, painters. They can't be a black woman my can you hear me you can't hear me but no. should we try to uh, uh, close and reopen the link Can you hear me? Is that better? <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> Headline news all over high society Philadelphia. Mrs. Cahill's uh, house servant has made an escape and is hiding somewhere in black Philadelphia. People go into action. The hotel staff, the black people who work at that hotel, are lined up in question. What do they know? Can't they help find this poor woman before she winds up in the infected district? Well, um, all the staff at that hotel is way more interested in helping the Underground Railroad than in telling the truth to their employers, so they don't give up a word. 
a white Episcopalian minister of those days. I wish I could tell you his name, but uh, William Still's history of this does not include it. But a big shot, guy with a big congregation, good friend of the widow Cahill. He goes to bat for her on the streets of Philadelphia, starts asking around. He knows a few better off black Philadelphians that start at, starts asking them, you know about this Cordelia Loney who's made a run for it. I'm really worried about her because when she lands in the infected district, who knows what hell could befall her. She could be taken into prostitution or worse. Well, he bumps into a prominent black man whom he thinks he knows pretty well. Zach, can you cue up the photo of Thomas Dorsey? All right. Uh, that's Thomas Dorsey. By 1859, he had worked and worked and worked and turned his little one-man catering business in Philadelphia into one of the most successful African-American businesses in the city and in the country. And he had a rare thing for an African-American family of that era in Philadelphia. He and his family owned their own house on Locust Street. So the minister, or priest, I guess, since he knew Dorsey a bit, when he saw him on the street one day, and this is all in William Still's history that he saved for us from the bulldozers, he walks up to this man you've got on your screen now, Thomas Dorsey, um, and starts talking with him about what happened to poor Cordelia Loney. And, you know, he says, Mr. Dorsey, uh, I'm sure you know, as of course I do, as a man of the cloth, that the scripture says, servant, obey thy master. One of the great myths of the Bible that the pro-slavery community put out back then. And you also know that that poor Mrs. Loney, if she's going to have to stay for any amount of time in the infected district, all kind of evil may befall her at the hands of what the minister called the degraded blacks. And so the minister says, I'd love to, you know, I'd like to make it worth your while, Mr. Dorsey, to help me. I know you know everyone in black Philadelphia. I know you know it better than I do. Get the word out. Let's get her back. She'll, be, she'll have a much happier life. You know it than I know. Let's go back to that nice old photo of, of Thomas Dorsey. There he is. Well, you know, he looks like he's all, you know, business and dignity and wealth. And you got to keep in mind, you got to look at the histories that the bulldozers almost took away. He was an escapee from slavery. He knew all of these issues. So uh, Murray and I like to imagine that when the minister said all this stuff, trying to enlist Dorsey in recapturing a woman who was trying to escape slavery, saying those words to this man, we imagine Dorsey taking a deep breath and standing up a little straighter and saying to the minister, first of all, and this is all in William Still's record, first of all, yes, I've read the scripture through and through, and you and I know that there's nothing in there that says one man can own another person. Second of all, I think if you actually took the trouble to walk around and ask some questions and get to know some people in the infected district, that's not what you'd find, and you might find just as many degraded whites in the white infected district as you find in the black district. And third of all, if you were, say, to give me $100 in order to be your helper in finding Mrs. Lonely, I would just as soon take that $100 and find her and give it to her and help her on her way. And as it happens, um, Cordelia Loney continues in her escape. And we're going to come back really briefly to her. But I like that story because, you know, there was this 
a minister, kind of a representative of the intellectual elite in our city back then, thinking he knew what was in those ruins, what the lives of black Philadelphians were like, what they might want to do, what their opinion might be of slavery. Imagine that, a big, bright minister trying to tell a black person what he should think about enslavement. Well, you know, we've all grown up quite a lot since then. But stereotypes die hard. I'm going to flash forward now to uh, the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And Zach, would you put up the slide of the late, great Asel Moore, rest in peace. There he is. I bet we get a bigger show of hands when I ask. Everybody know who Asel Moore was? <laughs> it's going to be on the test. Asel Moore, oh, you better, you better read your real history. Read the stuff that hasn't been bulldozed yet. Asel Moore uh, was a pioneering black journalist at, at my old newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, a great paper, I really believe that, with great principles, especially in terms of being a defiant watchdog voice who never let powerful forces push us around. But for decades, we were way too white. And Asel had the odd role of moving up from a copy aide, back when they were known as copy boys, to become the first black reporter at this major newspaper in a, in a city with a major, major important black population. So he got to learn the behavior of us white journalists the hard way. And when he prospered as a reporter and was, he shared a Pulitzer Prize in the late seventies with a, a reporter named Wendell Rawls. Uh, he got a column, he, he joined the editorial board. He became a really, important voice in this city. And when he had time later on to reflect, he said something important about what newspapers had meant to him when he was a bright kid growing up here in this cradle of liberty, you know, in the 50s and 60s, when we thought we were all getting pretty smart about diversifying our coverage and, and uh, you know, treating all communities equally. We, I think we all had an illusion that we were getting good at that. Well, here's how it looked to Asel Moore, who lived here then. Here's Asel's description in a great interview we did in 2004 or so with the great black journalist, Kia Gregory, uh, reminiscing about how newspapers looked to black Philadelphia in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s when he was coming up. Here you go. If you were black and lived in any city in America, you got a distorted view in the newspapers of who you were. Black people never got married and they must never die because there were no obituaries in the newspaper. They lived forever. They could only sing and dance We'll play basketball and get arrested. Well, thanks in no small part to Asel's relentless efforts to wake um, white editors up to the realities and get the staff integrated and get the coverage integrated and make the what the newspaper chose to cover and who the news, newspaper chose to hire look more like the communities that we that we claimed to cover, thanks in, in great part to him and others. We've gotten much, much better at all those things. But, um, well, I'm going on too long. I'll, I'll skip one of my favorite examples of some of the other people who helped make us better. And I think that trend is true all over kind of big time mainstream journalism. A great example is that the New York Times, arguably the best mainstream newspaper in the country, now is led by an African-American editor, a tremendous journalist, Dean Baquet. Um, you know, we've come a long way since we wrote about our black communities as infected districts or as places where the only news was sports, music, or crime. But listen to this, unless 
lest we start thinking we've got it fixed and worked out. Um, in those ruins these days, in those communities that we didn't do a good job of covering before, now live many, many people of the Islamic faith. And now this is in an era where all mainstream press are supposed to be pretty smart and equitable and enlightened and diverse. Nonetheless, two really good studies have been done of major mainstream media coverage. The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, CBS News, and other giants of mainstream journalism. Over the last four or five years, the coverage of stories involving people of the Islamic faith, where their faith gets mentioned, where there's references to to the faith or to Muslims. The rate of negative coverage as a portion of all the coverage is 70 to 75 percent. It's like that's our new infected district. Muslims. And there's no doubt we're getting better at it. Lots of great stories have, have been done that treated people as of the Islamic faith as what they are, real people with real lives and real families and real hopes and dreams. The drama of President Trump trying to close the borders to people from majority Muslim countries brought that out via excellent mainstream journalism that took many of the stories of those people trying to get into our country and made them real for a wider audience. They weren't suspects and terrorists and Muslims trying to sneak in. They were families trying to bring in a grandparent or a grandchild or a mom like Cordelia Loney, just trying to reconnect with her children. We're getting better at it. But we still have a ways to go. And to talk about what we need to do, I just want to briefly turn the floor over to that distinguished professor of, of diversity in journalism, the comedian Aziz Ansari. Good. Can you hear me? Yeah. And Dan, if, right. if you're comfortable with it, um, it'd be great to leave a few minutes for questions. Uh, oh, absolutely. Please. I just have one more line. Great. Well, so as Professor Ansari points out, even if we have come a long way, us uh, lofty intellectuals in the mainstream media, we still have a long way to go. And I just add as a postscript, uh, Cordelia Loney, the woman whose story William Still saved for us from the bulldozers, made it safely to Canada, whether she was ever able to reconnect with the four children that her benevolent uh, slaveholder sold away, we still don't know. Uh, I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, there should be a mic circulating. Yep, Sophia's got the mic. We have time for just a question or two. So if folks would like to ask either Dan or Donna or both folks a question, please do so. I'd love to get my shot of the audience back if, it, if there's a way to do it without, so I can see you all. Only if it's not going to take a while. Hi. Um, oh. Thank you both for that. That was very interesting. Uh, this question was actually inspired by, is it Davies' remarks at the beginning? But I think it ties into something that you were both touching on. Um, and it's based on the premise that I think nostalgia, which was a theme that ran throughout this, um, is not apolitical. And often ruins are politicized. And I wonder how that influences both of your work. Um, oh. Because though erasure is in itself political, so is what we choose to preserve. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> I mean, I understand your, what you mean, but I don't understand. I'm not sure exactly what the question is. I was just wondering how um, 
how people tend to use nostalgia to further goals influences your work as a poet and how mm -hmm. you write about nostalgia. Yeah. Um, or mm -hmm. Professor Biddle, Biddle's work as a journalist. Mm -hmm. um, should I just start, Dan? Yes, please. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely a component that I'm grappling with in different poems of the manuscript, um, and obviously um, nostalgia in the political sense right now with um, the massive nostalgia of or manufactured nostalgia of the Trump movement. You know, make America great again. That's pure, that's purely nostalgic. Um, I'm interested in kind of reclaiming nostalgia um, uh, from that usage of it and um, thinking of it as a um, as a as a kind of a, a snag in in a forward progress or a, um, a refusal of of certain directionality imposed from above um, so that's kind of um, some of the aspects I'm exploring right now, but but certainly it's a it's a large and complicated emotion phenomenon with with many different facets. Um, I think your questions about the politicizing of nostalgia, right? That that it's not neutral. It's a uh, you know, we think we're looking back with a neutral lens, but more often we're looking through a politicized lens in what we choose to remember and yearn for, or what we choose to think of as the full story of what went on back then. Um, I'll never forget how in the late spring of 2016, when Trump was, you know, just a storm brewing on the horizon and people hadn't um, figured out as the great Gene Robinson at the Washington Post to put it in a column that this was a farce to be reckoned with. Uh, mm -hmm. I, went to a, I went to a reading where a, a woman of color, probably my age or older, we're just shooting the breeze about uh, the campaign, and you know, it was late spring of 16, and she said, don't you think when he says, make America great again, what he's really saying is make America white again. And at first I thought, uh, you know, she was maybe uh, overreacting, but I've come to realize that she was, you know, exactly right. Um, and that thing Donna mentioned, you know, that nostalgia of thinking things were better back then. Yeah, I mean, looking back at how, you know, we're all sort of editors of what we choose to remember or have had the editing, you know, imposed on us by by the media or by what we've learned in school. I mean, all the stuff that Murray and I got to read about and learn about with all those great women and men of that early equal rights struggle, we weren't taught a lick of that in high school or college. It was, you know, someone way back at after Reconstruction decided that none of that belonged in the history books that were taught in American schools. And it's like you could be, if you're going to be accurately nostalgic for the American past, well, then you better learn up first on, on what it really was and not accept at face value that, I don't know, kind of um, misty vision of of happy families um, until you learn the bad side, until you learn that in those so-called infected districts, people with real lives and hopes and aspirations um, uh, were part of that history and just happened to have been kept out of the stories or, or uh, ripped out of the history books. Oh, maybe, can I add one thing real quick? Be because one of the sources of my thinking about nostalgia is something that comes out of East Germany, because I live in Berlin. Um, it's, it's called Ostalgia, and Ost means East. And um, 
its nostalgia for life under communism that was really perplexing <laughs> when it started emerging to people from the West. Like, how could you be nostalgic for, you know, those bad communist times? We got rid of that for you. But it was people's lives and, you know, the ugly architecture and what, what, whatever, uh, you know, the bad food. It, it was made up the fabric of their lives and they were nostalgic for it. Um, so that's maybe shaping what I mean by this kind of resistance to, oh, we're just supposed to go along with the, you know, neoliberal Western ideas of what we're supposed to like now or what's supposed to be meaningful in our lives.